Oh, there we go. All right. Hit the wrong, uh, we didn't have all the, the volume levels turned up. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. Good to have you here on a Friday. Uh, for anybody who is live streaming with us, of course, you'll know that. For anybody who is not live streaming with us, shame on you. You should be here with us. So if you're listening to the audio version after the fact, make sure that you're following us at inst or on Instagram at Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H Podcast, and keep up to date with the, the upcoming live streams so that you can come join us, join the conversation, make it a group discussion. It's one of the biggest benefits, honestly, of these live streams is that you can join in and ask questions and comment along the way during the conversation. So make sure that you come join us. And uh, for those of you that are live streaming today, of course, make sure that you take advantage of the opportunity to join the conversation as well. And uh, before I introduce my brand new guest today, I also just want to, as always, remind everybody, encourage everybody, really, um, to look for opportunities to give back. I made my donation to Charity Water today, as I promised everyone I would do before every episode. Popped up the receipt on screen there just for accountability. Um, but this is, again, just a, a reminder as a result of actually a conversation that I had with uh, Sean Lee, who came on the podcast a number of episodes ago. Just an encouragement to look for opportunities to give back. It's amazing how a little bit of money can go a long way, whether it's in your local community or with these bigger organizations as well. So just want to throw that out there. Happy Friday to everyone. And uh, I want to go ahead and introduce our brand new guest who is here with me today. Thanks so much, Elizabeth Blank, for coming Hi, to hang out with me. You. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, well, and I told you before we got started too, I, I know, you know, I, I think about these things, maybe I overthink about them, Elizabeth, but I, I think about, because I listen to podcasts so much and then I've been doing one for long enough myself, some right. of the commentary, some of the statements that people might say like, oh my goodness, I'm so excited to have you here. And it's, and it, it can almost seem robotic, right? Like people just like, percent. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But just so everybody knows, to break the fourth wall here, before you and I started the, the live stream here, I was telling you, I'm genuinely excited for this conversation today because we're getting into a topic that we haven't really spent much of any time on, actually on in 500 yeah. plus episodes. So thanks for doing yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I love any opportunity to talk about it. So um, underwater photography is my baby. <laughs> and that's where we're going to go. And, and I was writing some copy actually when, when I posted the kind of the announcement to Facebook and, and YouTube. And for anybody who's curious, who doesn't know, Facebook and YouTube.com slash Boca Podcast to see these um, live streams, so to join us for the live streams. But when I was writing the copy for that, it, kind of the way that I framed it was, you know what, like we'd look around at other photographers work constantly, right? And websites and Instagram and Facebook and Snap and everywhere else. And there's a lot of beautiful work out there just to be very clear, but it also looks a little the same a lot of the time, honestly. Sure. I mean, it's a lot of the same type of poses um, shot in a lot of the same type of ways, similar type backgrounds. Occasionally you get a really mind blowing scenery, but right. there's a lot of the same. And that's just kind of the nature of the game. But what I'm excited about for this conversation today, certainly one of the things is that we're talking about how to literally like turn that upside down and do something totally different if yeah. photographers are interested. And uh, so, yes, we're going to be talking about underwater portraiture here in just a second. And, and you know what? This is a, actually a good way to set this conversation up. So let's talk about brand position, your business's brand position. Okay. How would you describe that to our listeners here as, as a photographer? So my brand position is very unique in the sense that I am an underwater photographer in a landlocked city. I am um, out of Atlanta, Georgia. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting position that I have because there's not much competition in regards to other people shooting underwater photography in the area. Um, there are some people who, who do it as well, but I think that I might be the only one who really specializes solely in um, underwater photography being really my niche that I focus on probably okay. for 90% of my business. Um, and so, so my position's a really unique one. Um, I wish, it's funny because we were in um, the Cayman Islands in April and I was like, I think I picked the wrong place to start my business. Um, you know, because it's, it's really kind of limiting. We, we have lakes or we have swimming pools. And so the majority of my work is done within um, either my own pool studio, is what I like to call it, or um, in other families, my clients. Um, pools. So, well, on, on that note, I actually want to bring up your website here as I'm as we're talking about this because you all have to get a, a little bit of a taste 
for this beautiful work um, of Elizabeth. Thank you. We're here at elizabethblankphotography.com, literally like it sounds. And of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bookapodcast.com. Draw a blank. That's. <laughs> That's. <laughs> I can't remember my name. That's it. There Fair you go. enough. Well, here on the homepage of your site, first of all, and I was actually commenting about this to our head of marketing, uh, digital marketing, Jill. We were we were looking at your website, Elizabeth, and I was like, you know what? I just love. Sometimes it's the little touches, and as a call to action, jump on in for a underwater portrait photographer is a oh. beautiful call to action. So I just Thank love that you. little yeah. touch. Thank you. Um, but when I click on that, of course, we're we're brought into this incredible world that you've created for your clients in this underwater portraiture. And I have to also say too, that you know, speaking of variety, it's not like you're just doing the same thing under every, under your underwater at your pool all the time. Like there's quite a bit of variety here. So what type of environments are you photographing in? So probably 50% or so of my sessions are in the same body of water. And then the other 50% in, in my own personal pool. Um, but then the other 50%, like I said, are either at clients' homes or um, for commercial shoots. So there were a couple of different images that I just saw pop up on your screen that were for um, a couple of different resorts and things of that nature. So obviously at that point, I would go on site with them and, and shoot for for them on, on location. Well, I love the mixed perspectives as well. You know, you, you have some that are like truly underwater, period. Um, but yeah. it, but actually, it looks like a lot of these, you're kind of mixing that above water, below water yeah. kind of mixed perspective that makes it so interesting. This kind of the split image scene where you're getting kind of the, the scene on both ends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's really, really cool. I'm, I'm clicking on this one. It looks like you're on a cruise ship here. It, yeah. And you can literally see above the water and see the ship itself and then the person underwater. I, yeah, really, really cool concept. Yeah, so that, that water was so crystal clear, which also plays a role in it um, in regards to kind of what you can create and, and the, just the dynamic of the image. If the water is super crystal clear, it'll look like they're just suspended in air versus if there's a lot of sediment or, um, you know, different types of things in the water. So, well, and that's yeah. a great point. And I might actually now, for anybody who's not live streaming with us, uh, you wouldn't see this, but I've, I've now gone to Elizabeth Blank on Instagram, again, just like it sounds. And um, there's another example of exactly what you were talking about, Elizabeth, where there, there is that kind of split perspective and that water is so, you said this is in, in Grand Cayman, so yeah. clear. I mean, it, it almost yeah. looks fake. It's wild. I think that was the moment where I was like, I, I might have picked the wrong place to, <laughs> to have my... Hey, you could always move. There's always an yeah, opportunity absolutely. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I want to, I mean, we could easily spend uh, just an incredible amount of time here on this topic, but I want to dig into this just for a second because this, this is a bit of an anomaly when it comes to this conversation about brand position. As photographers, we are in a super crowded marketplace. There are a lot of sure. people that are offering services. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it ultimately makes it more challenging for anybody who wants to offer their services to stand out. Right. What you described just a few minutes ago is again, kind of an anomaly. It's an interesting situation in that you don't really have competition because you're in such a niche space. Well, was that intent? a large city as well. Okay. That, that even for the for the few people who are also doing it, the, the client, I mean, you know, the opportunities are plentiful. Um, but I think I interrupted you. Did you, were you going to say, is that intentional? Well, I'm, I'm curious, was that, was that intentional in advance? Like, did you say, okay, I'm looking around at the marketplace and everybody's doing a lot of the same stuff. I'm trying to find a niche that is unique and that will stand out. Or was it something you so, kind of fell on? That definitely played a part in it. Um, I started my business in 2010 and, and was newborn family child photographer um, for about six years and there was one on every corner, you know, it, it, it's the market that we are in. It is oversaturated. And then the quality obviously is going to be to totally different. So you can't just take, you know, it's not comparing apples sure. to apples necessarily. Sure. But, um, at about year six of my business, um, you know, being in business and really being so lucky in regards to how much, um, I was trusted for families in Atlanta to capture their memories and everything. I was so busy and um, it's a great problem to have. But also I think that there's a time where you're like, is this sustainable? Is this going to be a business model that I can continue to sustain, give the experience that I want to give, also have a quality of life for myself, for my family. Sure. Um, and so those were all kinds of things that led me to the point in 2016 where I was like, I'm going to rebrand. I'm going to remarket myself. And, um, you know, it was kind of serendipitous. We happened to put um, a pool in our backyard and I had two 
dear friends who are also photographers, they kept saying to me, you need to go underwater. You really need to go underwater with and just and play around. Sorry for the microphone. Um, and I was like, you know, guys, I'm just, I was really, really burnt out at that point. And it was kind of one of those things that if I had a day where I wasn't shooting for someone else, the last thing I wanted to do was pick up my camera for myself. <laughs> right. Um, and so finally, after probably two months or so of them really encouraging me, I, I went underwater with just, um, it was an Olympus, I, I believe it was the T5, T4. Okay. And um, that was all she wrote. I mean, it was just a point and shoot. I had no control over anything, but I pulled those files off and it was like this rebirth of my love for photography. And so wow. it's kind of what got me to where I now am in the market position that I'm in currently. So it's kind of a long-winded so story. No, I, that's, that's interesting. And again, I think it's important to highlight this because it is such an unusual position that you're in, but it, it's, it really truly highlights what we've spent endless hours at this point on the podcast talking about sure. within the concept of brand position, what it means to actually create something that's unique. And right. that word gets thrown around so much that I think at this point it's kind of watered down. People don't necessarily take it literally, but when we're talking about creating a powerful brand position, one of the ways to do that is to offer a truly unique service. Sure. And most photographers aren't doing that. And it could be a right. variation on a service that you, that's unique as well, right? You're offering portrait photography, but you're doing it underwater. That's the variation. Right. But it's such a unique variation that so few people are doing it. We're talking about like one or 2% maybe of the industry that's, that's really focused on it. It's such a tiny bit. Right. Um, so I think it's really cool. I think it's a really great Thank example. You. How do you, when it's such a niche offering like that, is it, is there a very large market for such Great a niche question. offering? So, so kind of back in 2016, when I was feeling like something had to give, um, it was kind of a, the perfect segue for me to begin to rebrand myself, um, you know, in terms of the, the marketing and whatnot, not necessarily my brand position, because I already had a brand that was still my name. Um, you know, in that sense, I was keeping that aspect of me but in regards to now informing my clients of what I was going to focus on primarily and things of that nature um, you know that that was kind of a challenge that I started to do and now I just totally forgot your question I'm sorry well <laughs> no I'm just I'm just curious because so one of the one of the I other elements of brand position that we discuss you know we, we, if we do go super unique one an example that right. I always give for example yes. is it, like if, if in Chattanooga I wanted to become a wedding photographer right I know there are a lot of other wedding photographers I could then I could position myself as black and white wedding photography for Chattanooga couples, or I could get even more niche. I could say black and white wedding photography for Chattanooga skateboarders. And what happens is you niche down so much that the market gets so small that you have Absolutely. to consider, is this going to support my financial goals and then decide how much to expand? So I'm curious what that's like for you. A, a thousand percent. And so I think where I was going and then got totally sidetracked by myself um, was that it is not obviously a huge market. Um, I really... My, my target market is families. So, um, you know, families who just want whimsical images of their children underwater, or it's the senior swimmer market. So your high school seniors um, okay. who their parents want to capture, you know, their prime athletic career mm -hmm. um, at its prime. And so those are kind of the two subgroups that really create my business and um, the success that I've been able to maintain since 2016. Okay. And then a slight portion is for commercial clients, um, you know, bathing suits, hotel brands, mm. um, things of that nature. But the the real meat and potatoes of my business is for that those portrait sessions. Um, but but no, to answer the original question, there's not a huge. Um, huge, huge demand for it. But also that allows me to then be really intentional with the work that I'm creating and focus um, my work, you know, intentionally on the families that I am working with and giving them that full experience that I was okay. not really able to do when I was, um, or as, as well as I wanted to do when I, you know, back in 2015 and okay. earlier. And do you have to go, I know you talked about commercial clients, so I'm assuming some of those might be out of town, but do you have to go outside the Atlanta market in order to find enough clients to meet whatever your goals may be, or can, can you sustain it there in Atlanta? So for the, for the um, apparel brands that are able to send me products, such as um, 
I had an algae-based underwater shoe that I shot last year, um, bathing suit brands, things of that nature where they can send me the product. I can shoot here, no worries. But okay. if it's, um, you know, obviously a location that they are trying to sell versus a product, um, yeah, then I will go out of town for those. Okay. Well, I, I I know we spent for anybody who's, who's used to listening to the podcast. This is normally maybe a three to five minute question. If that oh, we've spent no 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 no. What what I was what I was getting ready to say is we we've spent more time than normal here, but I think it's important that we do because yeah. this is so such a unique point of conversation or a example of this com this point of conversation regarding brand position, which is you actually have something that's unique, and right. uh, you know hope. The, the, the fact that you're able to, to use that as a launching point for a business, a sustainable business, um, I think it's really interesting to explore what that might look like for other photographers, whether they try to do it through underwater sure. portraiture or a different genre. This right. is a just a beautiful example of what is truly a unique brand position, and I think it's really cool. So we'll we'll keep going though because we got a lot to cover today. Yeah. And I want to jump to a different point of conversation, which again we normally cover here on the podcast, and that is about customer experience. And so I'm curious, with your all your experience as a photographer, even prior to the underwater work, what would you say is one of the driving ideas behind providing a great customer experience for your clients? That's a good question, and, and, and you know one that like I, I try to think on a lot because I think this day and age, the communication aspect of our world is so immediate. And so just, um, you know, you expect a response very quickly and things of that nature. And mm. so I think to go above and beyond that experience for clients, really, if I was to sit back and think, and it's going to sound cliche and I don't, I'll say it anyways, um, really kind of providing that emotional connection. I feel like my clients are, again, cliche, but but become an extension of a, a friend group to me um, in the sense that I don't feel like I'm just being hired just to capture one moment or one day, but that okay. it, it becomes a relationship that is really um, important for me to maintain in that regard hmm. of it, not just being a business interaction and us doing that, but for, um, for there really to be an emotional connection beyond just the two hours that we spend together, um, you know, at their house or so my I, house or wherever. Yeah. And I'm curious to ask you about this because, um, the way that you approach it, it sounds like you're super intentional about it. Some photographers will throw that idea out there. You know, I, I focus on relationships and you're right. It, right. it kind of, at that point, it sounds more cliche than what you're describing because it's just, it's almost like matter of fact that, that it just gets thrown out there because sure. that's what everybody else says kind of thing. Right. How do you maintain that in like genuine intention like actual emotional connection. I know we can only give so much. These are our clients. They're not our you know, family or whatever. But right. how do you actually do that consistently without exhausting yourself in the process? That's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I think just being authentic in every interaction that you have with people. Again, another catch word that like, I'm so happy to be here. You know, <laughs> it's so true. All the work. What, what other 2022 <laughs> um, No, but, you know, I think that people really can feel whether you are actually sincere, your sincerity, or if you're just moving them through the process of, okay, you've booked your appointment. Now I need your release. Now I need you to sign this contract. Give me your mm. session deposit. Things of that nature. I think mm -hmm. every touch point that you have with people can really drive home um, the fact that they're cared about and that it's not just about, at the end of the day, a business transaction. It's about, you know, capturing these moments in a memory for, especially for senior parents where, you know, their kid's going off to college next year. This might be the last time that they are doing something that is, you know, it's, it's such a, a milestone for kids. You get newborn portraits done, you get birthday pictures done, all of these things. This might be the very last time that they are experiencing this moment with their child. And so I think all of those opportunities that you have where you can really um, allow them to know that it's not just a name or a number on a page, but that you are invested in their um, child's future, or what they're doing after school, or where their swimming career is going to go. Are they going to swim at the university? Are they going to swim on a club team? You know, all of those things begin to contribute to that authentic interaction that um, I really try to maintain. But I, I without think the, exhausting myself, I know it is. No, 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 no. It, it's it's good, and I, I think you're you're exemplifying it even just in our conversation. It, it's the intention that you alluded to earlier yeah. that I think I I don't know. It, this is totally dorky, but like sometimes when I send a text and I am attaching an emoji to it, I yeah. will literally like if it's a smile emoji, I'll literally smile as I'm doing it because I'm I'm that much engaged in that conversation and exactly. wanting to translate that emotion. 
Right. And I, I think and I'm that I'm such a fan of emojis. So yeah, me I, again, too. Me too. I'm like, oh, all of them. And I'm like, I hope that they understand what I meant by that. <laughs> this is totally random. I'm not sure if you know this, but so I grew up in Japan and this is why I'm able to comment oh, on yeah, this, yeah. but I, I speak Japanese. And, and so em, emoji, the way that we say emoji, the way that they would actually say it in, in Japanese is emoji. And emo, like probably most people have figured out, is short for emotion. And so that's their, they're taking the English word and adding it in front of G, which is the Japanese term for character. And I so it's an emotional character. And that's, that's what we're using every day. Look at that. See, yeah. and I, I had no idea. Okay, now I have a question for you. Can I ask you one real Please, quick? Please, yeah. How do you say the word of your podcast? How, how do you pronounce that's a great question. And I've, I've alluded to this once or twice before, just because I know that anybody who actually cares, like they, they know I'm not pronouncing it correctly. But well, I'm not, I don't, I don't even know. I don't pronounce it correctly either. And I get made fun of so much, but it's just, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. So it is originally a Japanese word. Boke is the word. Um, okay. I say, if, if I were to say that every time, I think people would kind of turn their head and like make a weird face and be like, what are you uh -huh. talking about? Which is why I say boka. <laughs> and see, I but, say bokeh. Okay. Which... No, the jury's out. It, it can go either way. But yeah, the, the original word is Japanese and it's bulke. Bulke. Yep. I love it. Yep. Okay, sorry. Got off track. What, what, all I was saying though is the emoji. I yeah. think intention the, the and emotion yeah. will translate to the expression in our face. People will see it in our eyes because they're yeah. used to interacting with a person who's doing business for business sake and they may be going to a networking meeting, but they're showing up and they're kind of functioning robotically, almost like right. we were talking about earlier, robotically saying, I do it for relationships. Like exactly. our, people can read that pretty right. well. And they, they'll know where there is attention behind the expression, the eyes, the actual emotion that comes through. And, and I think that's just a good reminder. It may seem obvious to some, but I think it's a good reminder for everyone. Well, you've, ha you've had conversations with people before, right? Where they just seemed co totally glassed over, like their eyes. It's like you get 100%. no reaction from them and you're like, oh, I don't think we're even having the same conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they are mentally. But so I think just trying to be intentional and trying to make people feel seen and mm -hmm. be heard is, mm -hmm. is an important caveat of that. All day. Yeah. 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 When you, like when, when the tone of their voice doesn't match the words that they're saying. Right, right. Or, or they'll say, that's so funny. And you're like, oh, is and you're like really? You didn't even check his mail. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. This is good. I, I want to keep going. Talk to me about time management. Um, and and oh. you mentioned briefly to me that you've got kids before we started. And so like, yeah. you've got kids, you've got family, you've got business to run. Is there a big idea that's driving your ability to, to manage time and kind of juggle both and, and not get burnt out in the process? So it's an interesting thing that kind of goes back to what we were already talking about, which is the fact that the demand is not necessarily as demanding as it was when I was running a, a family portrait business, but okay. um, it's also fairly seasonal. So it doesn't have to be. There's absolutely creative ways that I could be marketing myself come November, December and into the winter months. But those are also really good months to kind of sit back and reevaluate what went well, what didn't, and um, kind of take that, you know, that information and process it. So the burnt out portion or the balancing of both, it's, it's one of those things that luckily I'm able to kind of meet the demand with that. Um, I do have to be a little bit choosy is not the right word, but a little bit discerning about which clients I'm going to take on every season because there are only so many warm days um, where the water is available if they want outdoor sessions and things of that nature. So I, I've, I've just over, goodness, the last 11, 12 years have, have kind of begun to or started really kind of trying to be intentional with the jobs that I take on and the things that I do in order to have that ability to manage my time and to also have a life outside of shooting and sitting okay. behind the camera or the computer to edit. Yeah. That makes sense actually. And, and kind of cool that having such a strong brand position actually enables you to have yeah. a little bit of balance at the same time. Right. So delegation is something we talk about a lot too, as it relates to time management. Um, and I know that some might be like, well, of course he talks about it. He owns an editing company, but of course delegation is applicable, not just to editing, but also Absolutely. to what, you know, administrative tasks, album design, accounting, et cetera. The list goes on. Is this something you've experimented with in your business and have you found benefit from it? No, I'm very bad at delegating. When we talked okay. about that initially, I was like, oh, I'm just going to have to like rip the Band-Aid off and admit this. No. <laughs> and I think that that's what got me to the point of where I was, I was like, something else has got to give because I'm, okay. I'm, I've always said I would be a terrible, terrible manager. I, um, 
I, I don't know that I set really great expectations and things of that nature. It gets muddled. And um, so, no, I'm not, I'm not a very good delegator. But again, we all could be aware of these things. And maybe once November, December hits, that should be like the top point that I think about and, and put yeah. on my list of things to, to sit on and, and chew on a little bit. Well, let I'm, me, not, I'm not a good delegator. Let, let me ask you this, because I'm curious, you know, that, for example, wedding photographers, I think on average, you're spending right. between 12 and 16 hours to edit a wedding after a, right. after a shoot or portrait photographers. I'm sure there's quite a bit of a range, but after and, and so it makes sense in those contexts to delegate that portion of it out because it's literally one of the most time consuming elements of their business. Absolutely. Right. When when it comes to doing post production work, at least for the proofs after a session for you, how long does it normally take? Too long. Oh, really? So it does take a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. The the um the underwater editing process is so labor intensive mm. because the um the images straight out of camera are and I'm getting sidetracked a little bit I think but um are totally the color is so mm. not what you see in my images so okay. the color correction alone takes a long time and I am typically working in layers within Photoshop to bring back the skin tones, but also not bring the water up, mm -hmm. um, the magenta levels in the water, mm -hmm. the reds in the water. Um, and so it's a very, it's a very fine tuned um, hand editing, you know, labor intensive process. It's, it's something that I've had friends who are also in the industry say like, just can't you make a preset or whatever? And I've tried. Um, it's not something that I have really put, again, I need to probably add this to the list, much time or research into um, because depending on the way the light's coming through the water and depending on, um, again, like the clarity that we were talking about earlier and things of that nature, it really, really kind of dictates how you go about editing the images. So totally there's makes very, sense. you know, the, the contrast comes up almost to 100 and things of that nature. So there's some specific things you can do, but... Um, in terms of the amount of work after a session. And I really, because I find that it's hard for my clients to understand what the final product is gonna look like if I just show them even kind of just a slightly edited version, you know, like a soft edit. Um, so I don't, I don't typically show galleries with not completely edited images. Interesting, um, okay. So it's a, it's a fairly, you know, it's a fairly big time commitment on the back end. Huh, how many, and then how many proofs would you normally deliver from a session or does it vary? I promise 30 and I typically am like 50 to 60. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I, you know, I haven't, so when I shot engagement sessions, I was shooting weddings mm -hmm. for about a decade and, and I did engagement sessions and 30 images was normally the, the, it was in the contract as the deliverable for a, a portrait session like that. Um, and I haven't heard a lot of photographers talk about that. And I think part of it is that we just tend to overshoot these days. Right. Um, and even if right. like overshooting is one thing, but then over delivering too. you know, what wedding photographers giving clients thousand images, 1200 images, 1500 images, portrait sessions, three, 400 it images. It feels overwhelming at that point, right? Even if it's, it's the one receiving it, it's like if and for an album, it's great, but I'm, you don't have the, I don't have the wall space to put that many images up on my wall, you know? Well, um, not only that, but there are still a couple of questions I have in my mind. One, sure. how, how high a quality are we actually delivering when we're delivering that many images? Right. You know, if it's, right. if we're giving them 70% or 80% of what we shot versus 30%. Right. And then the other thing too, is I still wonder, I mean, and we should be thinking about this as business owners. What, how does the client actually feel? Right. Theoretically, maybe on paper and they're looking at that contract or their website and they see a thousand images, they're really excited about that because it just looks big and it's exciting and they're paying and a high amount of money. Like and you're, you're not going to miss a moment. We're going to get it all. Yeah. Right. But when it actually comes to looking through it, I mean, does anybody actually know how many a thousand images right, actually right. is like how much time it takes to go through that and how much detail you're going to actually pay to each one of those thousand images? I just wonder if it were actually doing the client a service or maybe right. even a disservice potentially in some cases. Well, and my product is so specific in the sense that really for clients that are hiring me for sessions for their younger children, they have a really, really specific need in mind when they're coming to me. And usually that's for wall art. And it's either for, um, you know, the pool, like a pool house or a basement walkout where they are going to the pool. So it's usually a very, very specific spot in their home. Um, I've had some do dining rooms, like very fine art, um, large, large images um, for, for different areas of their home, but the majority of them are not going to be even printing out five of the images. Um, you know, they're, they're after that very, very specific frame that we're shooting. And so I think when I give them so many images, it begins to feel overwhelming to them. They don't want to see that much. They want to see a very curated cold gallery that would make 
beautiful art for their homes. And so I try to keep that in mind as well. Um, now, do I throw in one or two like silly ones that I think they would just probably get a kick out of? Absolutely, because that's fun, you know, just as a little surprise. But um, I try to remind myself that they want to see art when they open that up. They don't want to have to muddle through the images that I couldn't mm -hmm. narrow down myself, mm -hmm. you know? So I try to be really, really um, kind of strict with myself and what, what makes the final cut. That's really interesting way to put it. Cause I, I'm not sure if I've heard a photographer frame it that way. They want to see art. And it's funny because photographers get so picky. For example, in post-production, obviously over 14 years, we've had so many conversations with photographers who kind of e either say that what, well, they'll say number one in as a kind of an argument to not outsourcing their editing that this style, like my clients are going to know if I'm not touching the images because this is my artwork, right? Right, right. The, the flip side of that conversation though, when we're talking about the deliverable and we're thinking about how many images we're delivering, if we're delivering a thousand images or we're doing a portrait session, we're delivering 400 images, it, it does actually minimize the art. So there's this kind of importance placed in the art and one element of their photography, but then the other side and the deliverable, right. that seems to be kind of forgotten. And I, I don't think intentions are bad, obviously. And in, in fact, you know, there, a lot of photographers are probably like, oh, I, I just gave them a ton of images. I'm so excited. But right. I just well, wonder I if that- probably a lot harder as well when it's weddings, because mm. you're like, what if that was a moment that was valuable to them? You know, it's easier when it's like, that, that child was jumping into the pool. That was not a cute, you know, whatever. <laughs> right, it's it's right. not, I don't think I- I think the anxiety for me, if I was a wedding photographer, would be so much more um, in regards to like, well, was that a moment that I just wasn't aware of because I wasn't privy to, you know, the, the history or the background that led up to the moment. But that's, that is such an interesting, such an interesting thought. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it hanging. You did a good job. Okay. You brought up a good, well, good point of conversation here. And, yeah. and we'll kind of leave that. It, are we, are we delivering a final product that encourages the kind of the concept of art? as right. a deliverable right. or are we just and trying to deliver as many as possible yeah sure. yeah is this a sure. volume game or is it an art game right might be right. we'll leave that hanging elizabeth yeah. i've got one other question for you then i want to kind of dig back into this idea of underwater portraiture we talk a lot about books about reading here on the podcast i'm curious if there is a self-help book a business book that you would want to recommend to our listeners oh you know the one that i read that comes to mind and it's been a while now i mean it's been quite a few years but um, the Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Have you read that? I have. Um, oh, it's good. It's good. She um, she talks all about this principle, basically that you you just need to to do something. Like don't yeah. There you go. And so she, basically, the principle is is that when you think to yourself, I should really go out and go on a walk today, get do some exercise, that you think in your head five, four, three, two, one, go. And that you don't think about it any further because as humans, our, our um, mindset is to take the path of least resistance. So if we sit there and we think like, oh, but it's hot, then I'm gonna need to shower again and all of those things, you're gonna talk yourself out of it. And so in order to kind of train, I think that you just pulled up the Amazon um, listing, but in order to transform your life and to become the, the person who gets things done and who mm. is making goals happen for yourself. It, it's like, don't think about it very long. Just do it. Just you can't sit there. You just got to do it. So there will be mornings where the alarm will go off and I'm like five, four, three. <laughs> like, I just don't want to get out of bed. You know? yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's a really, really good one. And she's a very, very um, magnetic speaker. So mm. I think okay. that, that was probably, yeah. I've heard of her for sure. I, I don't know what I've, I've, heard of this oh, book but it's the, the i really love that concept because you're right we do and especially in first world culture where we are relatively comfortable most of the time we have right. so many options and choices and so making decisions becomes kind of more complicated and necessarily right. so i think in many cases so yeah. just going for it sometimes really is is the thing well it's funny she talked a little bit in an interview that i saw about she was going to bed one night and there was a spaceship launching and the countdown was there and it was, you know, they count five, four, three. And then the spaceship just launched. And she was like, if I just would do that, if I would just mm. do something instead of sitting on it, who knows what the outcome could be. So Interesting. anyways, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. And it's an easy one to implement. So. Okay. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes sent for yeah. everybody at bocapodcast.com. And by the way, for anybody listening in, viewing currently or listening after the fact, if you've not been to bocabookshelf.com, we've got kind of a dedicated section of our site that... Uh, will give you some of the most popular books 
um, that our guests have recommended. So for those of you listening in, make sure you go check that out because it's a really great resource. And of course, we'll add this um, to the ongoing list of recommendations. I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Let's get back to underwater portraiture. You talked a little bit about how you got into the craft. And, and I'm curious, you've alluded to this a little bit with the post-production process, but what, what are some of the biggest challenges, even one or two of the biggest challenges with the craft itself that you've faced so far? Sure. Um... No, that's interesting. It's it was it was definitely a learning experience, but it it was one of those things that you know I don't know if you think about like when you first picked up a camera for the first time and kind of you started to really learn about aperture and shutter speed and all of those things, and it was just all you could do. I don't know if you, at least my experience was it was everything I could do just to give me more information. I was working a mm -hmm. day job at the time and I would just come home and devour yep. books and, and videos and things of that nature. And I think that's what underwater photography for me did. But in that same moment, there was a, even though I had been a, you know, a professional photographer for six years leading up to that, it was an entirely different genre. And so what that meant was I was now learning what does that mean for me? How does that impact my editing process? Um, what is the turnaround time now for clients who have these sessions? What about for days where it is, you know, cloudy outside and things of that nature that just, sure. it's a, that learning curve was definitely one of the things. And then of course, just the logistics behind it, um, finding where you're going to shoot. If you're going to someone's home, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder than just saying, I'm going to go, there's dapple light here. So I'm going to put their back to the sun and then shoot through it and get the back lighting or whatever. You're in a, in a pool and while you can read the light a little bit, you're working in a really, really confined space. So that was just the other thing is kind of figuring out the logistics behind it, but it's, it's a good challenge and it's really been, um, you know, interesting for me and kind of kept things fresh in terms of going into situations. So, yeah, that's, especially if we've been in business for a while, things and, and yeah. honestly as a photographer when I was shooting kind of one of the reasons that I transitioned out of photography was because I I didn't feel the challenge and yep. but honestly a lot of that was on me because I could have created and I mean you're a great example of this I could have created another way to find challenge and and work through that but I, I didn't and so I was kind of getting bored right. in the process and so I think That's it's interesting true. whether we do it through our personal work or through the actual services that we're offering to take on new challenges like that is, it, it, I think it's invigorating. I yeah, like that absolutely. challenge of growth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's so much that you can pull from it, not just the growth or, or starting a new business or anything like that. But for me, it was just, it was that invigoration. I was so on the, on the fast track to being done with photography. I, like mm. I said, I just didn't want to pick up my camera anymore. It was, it, it just was very, like synonymous to me at that time for work. It felt like I didn't want to do it. But then once I, once I started making work that was kind of for myself, because those first couple of years I was really shooting just for myself. You know, it takes okay. a little while to change the intention of your brand and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so when I was doing that, I was like, oh, this, this is what I wanted to be doing. I, I felt like I was finally making art and photographs that mirrored what I wanted to be creating all along and that I kind of was finding a barrier against creating in regards to, you know, the posed family sessions and things like that. And the three-year-old who's not cooperating or, or what have you, <laughs> all of those things kind of go into that process. And so underwater, nobody talks back, you know, you just capture and parents That's true. are like, what, what, you know, do I need to tell them to do something? I'm like, no, the best moments happen when they're just doing their own thing mm. and I'm under here just observing and capturing it. It's, there's no pressure and it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you what you love most about the craft. Is it, is that one of those things? Silence, the quiet. No, <laughs> hey, why not? I get it. Home, I'm like, Hey, I'll go, I'll go under the water. Any, no. Um, it is so peaceful. Yeah. It's so peaceful. It's yeah. so peaceful. And it's, and you know, it, if you have kids, I mean, and obviously if you're doing an underwater shoot for a family, the kids are hopefully going to like the water. But if you have children in the water, they're having fun. It's so it's not, it's not like put on your button down shirt and go stand in a hot park and smile. And if you don't smile, you're going to lose whatever privilege they had. You know, mom, there's a lot of, I've heard a lot of threats and like, <laughs> oh, I'm sure, you know, you're not getting ice cream tonight or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. um, you know, the, the type of session just lends itself already to kind of everybody just, having fun and for it, um, you know, just to kind of take on a different, different feel than most photography sessions. So I think 
that in conjunction with creating art that I feel like it's maybe a scene that wouldn't otherwise be seen if, um, you know, if I wasn't down there capturing it, it, it would be a moment that would definitely have gone unrecognized to anybody above the water. So, so creating those moments and those images is, yeah, those are definitely two of the biggest perks. Well, I, I want to, we were chatting briefly before we got started today and, and you said you have six steps to share with our listeners. If they're curious, if they're interested in maybe sure. launching, say a, a segment of their business or a whole business geared toward this particular genre, how they might go about doing that. And I'd love for you to share those now with our <laughs> listeners, if you don't mind. Yeah, now, if I can remember them, that's going to be <laughs> okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm getting ready to take notes. <laughs> so I got my pen. Good. <laughs> I, I would say the very first one is if you're going to shoot these types of sessions for clients, um, especially well, regardless if you're going to their, their property or if they're coming to yours or if you're meeting, you know, at a, at a public beach or whatever, liability insurance is going to be number one, you know, just make sure you're covered, make sure that God forbid, if anything happened that just liability insurance, um, kind of to take a little caveat from that. If I have children in the water who are not 100% competent swimmers, I make sure that there's an adult in the water and I tell mm -hmm. the parents, I'm like, I promise you will not be in any of these resulting images, but I need you within an arm's length because I'm down there worried about how I'm composing the image and things of that nature. And mm -hmm. I need really somebody to be fully in tune to the safety of everybody um, there. I have so to, those, I, I got to interrupt you for just a second. Yeah. I just totally random, but I, I just realized that you talk about being down there. Have you learned to hold your breath for an inordinate amount of time at this, <laughs> at this stage? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. how long can you hold your breath? Uh, probably about a minute 20. Okay. All right. I mean, so it's not super long, but I'm also not going to crazy depths. Sure. So, um, you know, and, and the kids usually have to come up for air too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay. <laughs> Although I did get over COVID, I, I did get, um, scuba certified. So we'll see. I, have, oh, that's I, cool. I need to get it. I need to get a tank and put it in my pool, which would be bizarre, but you know, it would be fun. That would be incredible. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. I totally distracted no. you. So oh, liability oh, no, insurance no, no. and, and liability, um, yeah, super important yeah. for, for, you know, obviously to protect your home if you're shooting in your own backyard, but then also just for your gear. Um, I, I know mm. so many people who have lost a camera and lens, you know, situation um, to having a leak within their housing units, their water housing units. So um, insurance, yes, for home, for, for equipment. And then in that same vein, I think my second point would obviously be that you need to figure out what kind of equipment you want to use. I, I mentioned earlier that when I first went underwater that I had the Olympus, I think it was, like I said, I think it was the TG5-4. Um, and it was, a, it was a point and shoot. It, it allowed me to shoot raw and it, I think, maybe allowed me to change the shot. I can't remember. But I, I came out so excited that first day and then I pulled the images up on my screen and I was like, oh, okay, that didn't translate necessarily to what right. I was thinking I was capturing. So kind of knowing where you're going to go, what kind of investment you want to make in this world. And, and it's kind of one of those things like don't upgrade your camera if you don't know the reasons why you're upgrading. Kind of figure out your why before you go. I mean, there's a plethora of, of options to get you into the underwater market. You know, everything from a case for your iPhone to a GoPro to, you know, huge contraptions to put... Um, to put your mirrorless or your DSLR in, in. And so, you know, kind of figuring out what your personal need is, if you're gonna make it a, a really um, important aspect of your business, or if you're going to kind of just be doing it on the side um, is, is kind of just an additional thing you offer. Um, so I wanna, I wanna park here for just a second, cause you said yeah. something interesting that I, I don't know has been brought up in relation to equipment before, and that is know your why. And we actually talk about this a good bit, actually behind the idea of brand position, but I think it's also important when we're thinking about the, the potentially thousands of dollars that we're spending as photographers on equipment, why to do so. And, and then of course, as in line with that conversation, when to upgrade, cause there's stuff constantly coming out. And the reality is I think back even to the camera that I used I don't know, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I could still take a beautiful picture with Absolutely. that camera if, if I wanted to. So right. it, having, I guess, underlying, I don't know. And, and this is why I want to get your take on it. Are, are they principles? When you say th start with your why, is it principles behind what you're trying to achieve with your business? Is, are they personal principles? Like what, what does that mean when it comes to buying equipment? Yeah, that's a really good question that I don't even know that I've ever considered. Um, you know, knowing your why, I, I think would be just to have 
take, take some time to think about the expectations that you have by purchasing this equipment. So is it that you think I really need to, um, I, or I really want to supplement part of my business and begin shooting this genre at that point, then maybe, you know, quite a few different companies out there have rentals that you could rent um, and, and kind of play around with it, see if you like it. You might go underwater the first time and be like, yeah, this is not for me. Or you might be like, oh my God, that's all I want to do. Like, call the press. <laughs> I, I'm going to stop doing anything else. But, you know, kind of, kind of not committing, not putting the cart before the horse, I guess, um, in the sense that knowing, making sure that it's a good fit before, mm, yep. before you um, make that investment. Okay. I, I love like all new and shiny things. And I'm the same way. The camera that I had, that I started with, I could absolutely still take a good picture with it. And so I think it's really easy to get kind of taken by what's the latest, greatest on the market and, and just kind of knowing what you need from the equipment before you, before you. Yeah, this is, uh, again, a little nerdy, but I, this reminds me of my conundrum and totally first world problem, but with motorcycle buying. So I buy way too many motorcycles, I, not at once to be clear, but like over time, I've bought a lot of different motorcycles Right. and I'm kind of at that stage again where I'm like, okay, what's next? But what I think is, you know, part of it's just the excitement. I've only ridden for a few years and so I just want to try all this stuff and it's really cool. But at the end of the day, to your point, and I think this is a good lesson for everyone, whether it's in photography or anything else in life, is what is it that I'm trying to achieve with this? Right. Um, and at one point, I actually, and I just went back to review it the other day because I am kind of at that crossroads point again with, with my motorcycles, and decide or be very, very clear about what it is that I want to experience. Like, right. what is what it do that I want I'm looking for? What that new model to get? What do I want to get out of a new model? Well, there's that, yeah, but we, we go, I, for me anyway, Motorcycle riding actually started as a means to connect with people. And okay. and I've hit the stage of my life now where I'm, I'm no longer experiencing that to the same extent. My family isn't riding anymore and, and the list goes right. on. So that, that kind of underlying reason behind why I even got a motorcycle in the first place is gone right. and uh, largely. And so, you know, do I go back? Do I go pursue that again? Do I let it go all together? And then I think about, and I know most people listening are not motorcycle riders. They don't care about no, this but stuff. It's but it's applicable, right? It's the, totally the thought applicable. process behind it. Yeah. And so I, I'm really glad that you highlight this because again, especially with equipment and all the new equipment coming out these days. And, and frankly, I mean, I can take a beautiful picture with this thing right here, this That's phone. Right. And, right. and so, crazy. yeah. So being super clear about what it is that you're trying to achieve. I mean, if we want to go as deep as, as an individual, but then certainly with the business model and then how that translates to the decisions about buying, I think that's right. a really, really great um, point make, of conversation. Make wise decisions, make wise decisions yeah. and know, know what you're going to do with it. Um, yeah. I think is, is important. Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking at my, okay. my notebook here. <laughs> I'm going to so, have to pull up my list. I think I've <laughs> no gotten worries. myself so off track. <laughs> So number one was to set up liability insurance. Number two is to choose your equipment wisely. T take us to number three. Okay. So my number three was to kind of figure out wh where you're going to access the water. Some, some people might live on the coast and it's going to just be super easy. Others might need to figure out if, if you don't have access all the time to, to a pool, are you going to go to your client's house? Um, are you going to try to use a public pool, which, you know, that also comes with its different challenges because then you have the, you know, the rules and regs of that, that body of mm -hmm. water. But then also if it's a public pool, the clarity of that water is typically, if you're going to shoot in a public pool, do it in the early morning because of sunscreen and all of that, it's just going to make the water probably not as pristine as you, you're hoping. Um, okay. so that's just a little side note. I don't, um, so kind of just figuring out where the, the logistics of it all. So which Insurance, is especially important, gear, like you were saying earlier, water. being in a, in a marketplace in Atlanta where, I mean, yeah, you've got lakes, but it's not necessarily easy access to water. So you can't, and, and this again may seem obvious to some, but this is, this goes back to that conversation about a, choosing a brand position and something that's unique. You got to be, you got to make sure that not only will the market support it, but two, that I guess in this case, your surroundings will actually support it and, right, and to have right. a strategy in place to do so. Exactly. And I've got, I've got really great friends who are um, underwater photographers in Hawaii and different places around the world. And they're like, you shouldn't pools. It's, it's just a different vibe because yeah. their environment, I mean, it's magnificent, mm. but it is a very different feel. And, and you know, the aesthetic, what, what is the aesthetic that you're going to try to create? And then kind of figuring out what is going to be the best location in order for you to achieve that. So um, that would be my third point. And then probably fourth would be understanding your ideal client. And we've kind of touched on that a little bit already that mine are 
families, typically of younger children, um, you know, like your six, like once they kind of are become confident in the water until about the, the 13 year old range or so. For some reason, I'm not seeing very many tweens. Um, and I, I'm wondering if that's because they're holding out, you know, the thing I will say about this type of work is that it's not a huge repeat. Um, I, I don't have a ton of clients that I see like I did back when I was shooting um, families every year because they don't necessarily want an underwater image for a Christmas card. It's kind of one of those mm -hmm. things that, again, once we've created that wall art, that it's going to stay up in their homes for years to come and that there's just not as much of a demand. So kind of figuring out how do I keep myself still relevant to those families? How do I get them to refer me, um, you know, to if, especially if it's a senior swimmer, how do I get them to tell everyone on the swim team about this and, and kind of make it known. And so kind of just being creative in that regard to while your client acquisition is, is kind of turning over, making sure that the people who've had the experience with you are the biggest cheerleaders for your business um, is, is, you know. An that makes sense. Yeah, I was making notes here. I, it, I initially wrote down, understand your ideal client as you were talking about, but it also right. seems to kind of speak to what you're saying, speaks to the idea of knowing your marketplace too and understanding. Right. Those, I mean, those two things go hand in hand. You got to know the right. marketplace and how it functions and, and where that demand is. Yeah. And then certainly understanding that that a lot of that business may just come from your clients who are going to then refer you. So Sure, absolutely. And then once, you know, because people love to, social media is great in that way, that if you do have a big milestone coming up, a high school graduation, things of that nature, those images are organically getting put out there already to further, um, to, to people within my client or target market already. So um, it's nice because it kind of works as a double, as a double, um, I'm, I'm doing my marketing and then they're helping me as well, which um, I think sometimes it doesn't happen um, in regards to, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll see images or sessions that come up and there's not credit to the photographer underneath. And I'm like, who took those images? Um, yeah. And because it is such a saturated market, I think a lot of times they're like, it just goes without even being asked, which mm. is a, is a, you know, two-sided problem. But um, when when your market position is unique, um, it typically, it, it, people know, like I've, I've had people say, oh, you're the underwater photographer. And I'm like, I, oh, okay, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm happy to be known for that. That's awesome. But, um, you know, in circles that I wouldn't otherwise think. So it kind of speaks for yourself when you're doing something unique, I guess. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if somebody said that about me and that's what I was doing, I'd be stoked because that's yeah, the whole yeah. that's the whole idea behind a brand, a, a great brand right. position is that well, and it's something when that, they think yeah. of you, they think of, in this case, underwater photography. And, and if, if you're doing your job well, if that's the case, so well, props to you. It's 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 a good one. I, I just love it. So I'm hoping that it feels that way to everyone. Um, and then I would say. The other, the other, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my phone, but I'm trying to remember exactly. The understanding of Lightroom and Photoshop is obviously, that that's a huge, huge piece of it. Um, I always try to tell people, like, if you are going to go into this world of underwater photography, like, don't, don't get discouraged when you're pulling those initial images off the file, uh, off the card, um, because they're not going to look like what you saw down there or what you're envisioning as your final product. They are going to be very, like, flat almost. Um, there's just not very much dimension and all of that comes back in post-production. So um, it's because you're shooting through a medium such as water and mm -hmm. it's um, taking out like all of that contrast that would otherwise be there. You know, water's like, I think it's 1.6% more dense than air. And so anytime you've got something that's between you and that, that shutter. Um, and the know, way that it's or, rendering yeah. light. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And and the way it's bending light and the refraction and all of that, it's it's um, an interesting situation. So don't be discouraged when you get those images off of your camera um, the first time or second or third. But know that you can make your vision happen with, I mean, it, I said that it was a really labor intensive process because I'm going in and doing the layers and things like that. But with probably five or six clicks, um, you can have that looking almost to what your your eye saw while it was in the mm. in that situation. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, and then probably the last thing I would say is if if you are thinking about going into business as an underwater photographer, just knowing that while it is now depending on where you live, obviously if you're somewhere tropical, you can 
probably do it 12 months a year. But if you're somewhere in North America or South America or wherever where there is very, um, you know, defined seasons, know that you can get creative and that it doesn't have to be something that is only from May until September or October. Um, you know, through, there's a lot of, I don't, I don't know if it's the same way in Chattanooga, but we've had a lot of like the little sw swim schools pop up um, within different shopping centers around mm, here. Okay. Um, and so I think if you just get creative in regards to selling your the, the product that you are selling, um, you know, and obviously that goes with creating relationships and things of that nature. But once you make those relationships, kind of getting creative in terms of what you can offer to your community and what is available through you, not just in the warm summer months, um, is, is a huge way to differentiate yourself from just being that seasonal photographer to, um, you know, being, being around always. Well, I, I really, this has been like such a practical and kind of wide ranging conversation too. I, I really appreciate it. You're a great conversationalist and a teacher and the way that you're able to break this down. And, um, this has been a lot of fun. I just remind, and as, as we've been talking, of course, I've been popping up your website and social media, but if you will, as we're kind of closing out here, if you'll remind our listeners, especially those who are just listening to the audio side of things, yeah. where they can find and follow you and, and learn a little bit more, that'd be awesome. Okay, so blank again. So when you go home, when you're trying to search for it and you don't, can't remember it, it's just Elizabeth <laughs> Blank, B L A N K. Um, I'm on Instagram as Elizabeth Blank, and then Facebook's Elizabeth Blank Photography. I will give the caveat that I do not update Facebook like I should. It's um, it's a ghost town over there, but um, Instagram's probably the best, and then ElizabethBlankPhotography.com. Cool. Yeah. And I was just popping these, these up here on screen again. So everybody watching, of course, you can see that, make sure that you go find and follow Elizabeth and, um, and then dare I say, DM her, if you have any questions, do we put that yes, out there, Elizabeth? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I really appreciate yes, you yes. sharing with, with all of our listeners today, everybody listening in, make sure you follow us, Boca podcast and, and join in next time for the upcoming live streams. We're usually going to be pushing out two a week. And, uh, so come hang out with us, join the conversation everyone have an absolutely wonderful day. Thanks again, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me, Nathan.